Hello everybody and welcome to another Social Blueprint interview. But before we start with the interview itself, I just want to say here at the Social Blueprint, we are so much more than just conversations, events. I believe we have the biggest events calendar in Melbourne. Aid, we have over 500 resources signed up for you. All you need to do is to go sign up on our website. It's totally free and you'll have our very next newsletter. Anyway, with that aside, interviews. Right now, we know nothing is on the forefront of Jewish people's minds than October 7th. And keeping with that theme, we want to bring you here stories from people that have just been over to Israel to hear firsthand what they feel, what they see. And I'll foreshadow and say that there are very divergent opinions, but each one has their own unique story. And keeping with that, I'm thrilled to bring you today Tammy Slade. Tammy, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, Tammy, <clears throat> you didn't just happen to show up in Israel, if you will. What made you decide, I need to go over there myself and see it with my own two eyes? Mm. Uh, well, just like everybody, um, myself and, and my family were very uh, traumatized by the yeah. events of October 7th, and we were completely glued to what was going on over there from that time onwards and um, it was sort of a busy time also in the family we had someone finishing year 12 and all sorts of things but um, an opportunity came up and I was asked to join a UIA mission for four yeah. days and I just thought it was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up um, and then um, because I was going anyway I decided to tack on an extra week of volunteering on top of that. Right, and volunteering specifically, what did you actually do over there? Yeah, so when you go to Israel, you sort of have to go with the flow a little bit. There's not Definitely. a lot of um, planning ahead when it comes to the volunteering. So I was very lucky that uh, a good friend of mine who lives there has been doing a lot of volunteering um, just from October 7 onwards. So I did some things with her. Um, we went down to the south and did a. We helped out with a barbecue there on right. Army Base, uh, which was amazing. Uh, what else did I do? I also went to a hotel in out just outside of Jerusalem where we helped out with some art classes for a displaced community from the south. Um, I also did some avocado picking with some friends and visited some injured soldiers at uh, Tel Aviv Hospital. So, yeah, a varied, varied experiences. Tim, the UIA mission, mm -hmm. what was involved other than a lack of sleep? <laughs> yeah, so it was incredibly well organised and jam-packed. So we did a lot, a lot of things. Um, one of the days we spent in the south of Israel and we visited two kibbutzim. We went to Re'im and Be'eri. Um, and we saw the horrors that happened there and what were remains of the, the horrors there. Um, we also visited the site of the Nova Music Festival yeah. while we were down there. Um, and we also went to the car where they sort sorting through the cars that were all burnt and, and damaged. Um, that was pretty harrowing um, because, you know, there's, you, you see on one side of the yard, I should say, well, it's like a, a big field, and one side is stacked up with cars that they've already sifted through and, right. and gone through. They basically have to um, sweep all the ash and everything that's left inside just in case there are remains, and then those bags with the ash get buried. Um, and then, you know, in the middle are the cars that they still have to go through. So, um, so that day was, was quite intense. We also um, heard from uh, Shifra Bukhoris, who is a police superintendent in the area. Um, she's an incredible woman. She's uh, modern orthodox. She right. has 10 kids. And she, on the morning of October 7, got a call and left her family and her kids on Simchat Torah and 
gathered a, a colleague of hers and went in her own little car, which we saw after. Unbelievably, it was undamaged. <laughs> we no. saw it on the day that we were down there. Oh, wow. And she spent the next 12 hours um, saving people and arresting terrorists. And there's a, actually a whole um, YouTube <laughs> video made about her afterwards. She's, she's incredible. So we heard from her. Um, so that was one of the days. We also... Um, visited a hotel in Tel Aviv that um, had a whole community of a, a displaced Moshav mm -hmm. from the south. Um, and that, that was very eye-opening. We heard from two people who had um, stood up as the leaders in, in that Moshav after October 7th. So one of them uh, by profession is a lawyer, but mm -hmm. after a month of moving into the hotel, she realised that, you know, particularly the kids, everyone under the age of 18, were just, you know, running amok and just, you know, very rudderless and getting depressed. And so yeah. she took it upon herself to organise all the um, education. So she organised all the kids to go to local schools and she's uh, set up a, um, a creche and a kindergarten within the hotel. And she was incredible. And, you know, she's one of the people who, um, I guess, just made me realise how difficult it is for these right. communities. You know, there are um, you know, a couple of hundred thousand people who are displaced from their families. And a lot of them who are living in the hotels, it's, it's really, really difficult on family life. If you think about people with young kids right. you know they're living in separate rooms and if you've got young kids you need an adult in each room so often um, husbands and wives are, are in separate rooms with kids so it's a really really trying thing um yeah we also heard from a lot of um diplomats and sort of senior people within the um army and yeah so it was really interesting one key theme I am hearing, though, is that the unity of the country and the morale is extremely high. Did you notice that as well? Um, I think that what I noticed and what I was, you know, what made me feel very proud and, yeah. and um, you know, it was very heartwarming to see that, you know, Israelis are very united yeah. and they are really coming together to do whatever needs to be done to survive and to um, help each other out. And that was, that was incredible. I think that um, I had an opportunity to meet with a lot of everyday Israelis, not just yes. talking about leaders. And I think for me, um, I was hoping to come home feeling very uplifted. I'd heard right. from other people who had been that they came home feeling very uplifted. And whilst there were lots of um, heartwarming moments, for me, it was also very um, sad to see the trauma um, yeah. and the exhaustion in everyday Israelis. So, you know, there's not one person in the country that hasn't been affected in some way, who doesn't have someone held hostage or right. injured as a soldier. Um, so, you know... For me, I think that what I saw was a very, very traumatised and, and depressed and exhausted country. Right. Yeah, there, there's certainly... Uh, we feel like that there's a 24-hour news cycle over here, but they are living it. Yeah, exactly. So, and you mentioned that you visited soldiers, and I also know that you have children about our kids' age as well. Mm -hmm. um, did it hit you that, like, these are kids? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, yes. And for me, that's something that I've always thought about when it came yeah. to the IDF. You know, even when I visited Israel as an 18-year-old, I thought, you know, this could be me. And yes. definitely now, with my kids being the same ages. Um, and also for me, I think what really hit home was the hostages. And I think about them a lot in relation right. to my own children. Yeah. Um, particularly the young female yeah. uh, hostages at the moment. They're the same ages as, as my daughter. So, you know, Nalma Levy and yeah. Liri, then Noah, Agam. There are so many of them the same right. age as my daughter. So I think about them every day. Right. And do you sense that with the hostages, the country is just, will do whatever it takes to get them back? 
Uh, look, I, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. I yeah. think that as time goes on, I came back from Israel a month ago, and I think that what I'm hearing is that there is a little bit of division now yeah. in relation to that. So, um, you know, there's a huge movement of, you know, bring the hostages home. But um, I, what I am hearing is also that um, there's also a thought that we just need to finish Hamas at all costs. Yeah. Yeah, I think that all around, the one word that comes up in my mind is frustration. Mm. Everyone's frustrated. Yeah, I think so. So I, I'm not sure if there's complete unity right. in that regard in Israel right now. Yeah. And also, I'm curious about volunteering. Mm -hmm. The It really brings to, to bear, I suppose, to Kun Alam. How do we make the world a better place? And especially after October 7th, where you really think to yourself, how do you fit in? Have those thoughts gone through your mind as well? Yeah, so, you know, if you'd asked me about the concept of Tikkun Alam yeah. before October 7th, I would have had probably a bit of a different answer. So I've always been someone who volunteers and, right. and tries to do communal work. And before October 7th, it was sort of a no-brainer to me to do community work within the Jewish community and right. also the wider community. Um you know, at the moment now, obviously, there's a great need in Israel. But a lot of people have asked me since I've come home, like, what if you can't go to Israel? Right. And what if you can't, you know, don't have the means to send money to Israel? Sure. Um, so for me right now, I've given a lot of thought to this, Tikkun Olam, at the moment, I think what we're being called at the moment to do is to focus a bit more inwards. Um to our Jewish community. I, I see the Jewish people as one, you right. know, roughly half live in Israel, roughly half live in the diaspora. And so for people who are not able to help out with the existential crisis that's yeah. going on in Israel, I think what we need to do is look at the Jewish community here, where yeah. we're living. So, um, you know, whatever that might be, whether it's volunteering in um, Jewish organisations or giving thought to um, where you donate money yeah. or um, if that's not something that's viable for you, thinking about where you even just spend your money on groceries or right. everyday items, um, trying to support the Jewish community, yeah, um, Jewish sure. businesses, Jewish professionals, because we're kind of alone right now. Yes, we were uh, talking about it beforehand that I don't think that I, I personally, I've never felt so alone. Mm. Yeah, and I was talking to my husband about it the other day, and I said it's kind of like, you know, there's the analogy of being on an aeroplane and we're in a bit of a nosedive, and, right. and the oxygen masks have come down, and I think that right now we need to secure our oxygen masks. We're, you know, in crisis, also in the diaspora, and um, whereas Tikkun Olam for me used to be looking after everyone. Right. Right now, Tikkun Olam is looking after ourselves. Yes. And then hopefully one day, I do believe that one day this will pass and we'll be able to sort of think about the rest of the world as well. But right now, I think Tikkun Olam is focusing inwards on ourselves, on the community. That we're in. Uh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I'm going to jump around a little bit from my questions here, but on that theme of looking after yourself, uh, we were talking about it too. There's so much information on social media. You can be glued to your phone, mm -hmm. your television, whatever it may be, 24-7. Mm. There's no right one right way, but how are you managing to manage yourself, if right. at all? Yeah. Uh, I think people close to me might argue that sometimes I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, Shabbat is a, a nice break from social right. media, um, and, and that's been important. And for people who don't keep Shabbat, I encourage you to take a break from social media. Um yeah, I, you know, over the summer I had a, a week away with the family, which right. is also really nice. So, uh, you know, I do think it's really important, you know, this is going to be, this is not going to be over quickly. Yeah, unfortunately. Right? So That's why we do have, Yeah, we do have to look after ourselves and um, whatever people need, whatever that looks like for people, that's what we should do to look after yourself. Yeah, and I also agree that looking after the people that you can help that are right in front of you sometimes is the most important factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Including, and that leads me to your children. Uh, there's been so much, frankly, social media that really, when you look on TikTok, it, it, it's uh, objective information. Mm -hmm. that there's literally over 10 times as much pro Palestinian rhetoric as pro Jewish. How are you managing your children? Um, look, they're at an age where, you know, I've got no control over what they're doing on their right. phones. Um, I think that what we are trying to do is just um, instill in them pride yes. in being Jewish and um, being Zionistic and believing that, you know, whereas in some circles the word Zionist is, is a dirty word, you know, teaching yeah. them that, <laughs> that um, it's something that we can be proud of and, and it's something that's important and integral to being Jewish. Um, and just giving them the confidence to, to show up in the world proudly as, right. as Jews and, you know, whatever they're seeing online, also um, giving them the tools to uh, learn for themselves the, right. the historical facts and the, the history of Israel and, right. and so that, um, yeah, they have the confidence to, to, to be proud of who they are. Yeah, because one of the things that it's just so incredibly frustrating and I'm sure uh, so many people feel this way too is when you see just blatant lies that, mm. are, that are spewed and I, I suppose, at least for us, like we want to arm our children with real facts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean people are always going to agree, but at least you have information. Yeah. Uh, especially when you see something that's really uh, uh, unbelievably nonsensical on here. So. Yeah. And I think it's um, also important for our kids, but also for us, to know um, when it's appropriate to have an argument with someone. Right. And when to walk away and not engage um, online and in person. So that's a, a key point as well. Absolutely. And sometimes we're all guilty of not necessarily making the right choice. 100%. <laughs> it's yeah. called being a human being. Yeah, yeah. Tim, you have four children mm -hmm. and one has been to Israel and another one is going to Israel right now mm. for in, in, in a very, very near future. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Well, yeah, so my oldest was in Israel on October 7th and um, she came home shortly after. That was obviously um, a very difficult period of time yes. in, in you know, yeah, straight after that, um, just working out what was the best thing to do. And um, my next one is actually there now, okay. so he's left. And um, look, we just believe that, you know, Hamas isn't going to win. So we're going to keep going with our lives as planned. And, you know, if things need to be adjusted as we go, we'll deal with it. Um, but we, you know, Israel is is very important to us. So Tim, I can't help but say that, that is the Jewish spirit. And that is why people say at times that we've had a lot of success that we bat over our way. And it's because of that perseverance that lack of being a victim, if you will, mm. uh, we get on with things. Yeah. And I think it's just a great lesson that you're embodying. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, um, I heard that very clearly from Shifra Bukhwes. She, um, she said to us as a group, when I was there with the UIA group, she said that, you know, following October 7, she, a couple of weeks later, she sort of fell into this slump where she noticed that she didn't want to listen to music, she was not sleeping well, and um, even things like eating meat, she didn't want to eat meat based on the things that she saw on October 7th and the days after. Um, but then she said, I just decided, like, we are going to live, you know, um, the, we're always going to be surrounded by hate, so we have to be as strong as we possibly can, and we have yep. to live, and we have to live with joy, because otherwise they win. Yep. And we can't and Tim, I also, I just want to ask you, because you sit on an interesting spot within the Melbourne community where you are, are more observant, but you also are very, it, it, sit in a secular world as well. Do you have any thoughts about that? Have you seen any differences in the way people are reacting? I mean, I really see the community here coming together, but I'm yeah. just curious about you. Yeah, Greg, I agree. I think um, in the more secular world, it's been beautiful to see um, a lot of people 
for the first time in their lives, you know, going out and buying a mac yep. and David and feeling really proud and feeling the importance of um, being outwardly and proudly Jewish. Um, and, yeah, seeing the way the communities come together to do what we need to do um, as a community here in Australia to support each other and to uh, fight against the anti-Semitism that's reared its ugly yes. head. Um, so, yeah, I do feel like we're very united and, and that's, I guess, one positive that's come out of a really awful situation. Yeah, no, for sure. And it's, as you said earlier, it's going to be a, it doesn't seem like the situation is going to resolve itself quickly. Mm. Uh, let's hope we're wrong, but it certainly doesn't have that. In closing, as somebody, as we have to play the marathon game, not the sprint game, if you will, mm. do you have any thoughts for just what we could do right here in Melbourne to really help ourselves and help the wider Jewish community? It's a big question. It's a big <laughs> question. It's a big question. Um, yeah, like I said before, I think it's it's really about um, re-evaluating uh, where we put our time and our energy and our resources financially and any other resources that we have. So. Um, you know, for people who are in philanthropy, maybe rethinking the organisations that you support. Um, like I said, you know, just day to day where, where you're spending your money, where um, you volunteer your time. Um, yeah, I think just those sorts of things. Yeah, you know. absolutely. And, you know, again, there's never been, I think, a crisis in our lifetimes anything even close to this mm. so we really do in closing have to stick together yeah 100 percent. and you know for those who can go to israel and support that way they the israelis really really appreciate it when we when we come they make make the effort to go such a, fa a long way a long distance to to visit them and there's no shortage if you have the time and resources to go to israel there's no shortage of ways that you can um, make yourself useful and every um, bit of money that you spend there, every bit of effort and time that you give of yourself there is appreciated and, and useful. That's great. Mm. Thanks, Tammy. <laughs> Thanks for having me.